Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly, and we're back with another Cape Lookout Fishing Report with Captain Chris Sice of Not The Real World. How you doing, Chris? Hey Marvin, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm getting there as always, and we wanted to bring you back even though you really haven't been on the water because you've had a pretty eventful month uh, on on the non-fishing front that's kind of kept you from talking to all, to all of our listeners. Yeah, unfortunately, I had a, uh, a little bout with COVID, which uh, went fairly smoothly. But I did quarantine and kind of stay away from everybody, so I didn't pass it along to anybody else. Um, <clears throat> and then um, more recently, I fell off the bow of my boat in a parking lot and fractured, broke, splintered, all the things, uh, three ribs. So I've been um, laying in bed a lot and uh, trying to recover from that. I haven't been able to move too well, unfortunately. Yeah, never a good thing when the uh, orthopedist tells you that you have a very unique way that you've broken your ribs. Yeah, that was that was a, a, a an eyebrow raising uh, comment that she made. And she showed me the splinters, and they kind of like stick out like barbs off a fishing hook almost. So she said that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, well, lucky you. So you know what we thought we would do. You're you're hoping to get back on the water here in about a week, um, but yeah. in the meantime, you and I talked about something that. You know, we always think we've talked about it enough, um, but something always happens. And we're not saying that anybody that was on your boat did anything wrong, um, but it just comes up. And to talk about basically uh, etiquette and dealing with a guide and what to think about when you're booking a guide and fishing from a boat. Sure, absolutely. So um, there's just kind of a couple of things to keep in mind that when you reach out to a fishing guide, um, most notably to let them know specifically what you are looking for in terms of a fishery. Um, you know, you could have uh, a, a type of a fish that you want to catch or a type of fish you want to catch in a specific way or if you want to learn how to do something or something of that nature. Definitely pass that along to them up front and let them know. But be aware that uh, the conditions or the situation or, or the area that you're fishing may not be conducive to what you're looking for so um letting them know up front about what exactly you would like to do is very very helpful to the guide um and then to be kind of just open is that like if you're on a vacation down here in uh moorhead city where i'm located at you want to chase spanish mackerel but the big blow that just came through has pushed them all off well you may not be able to catch spanish mackerel anymore. so uh, just being willing to be flexible with the guides so they can put you on the most amount of fish possible for the best day um, is is definitely very helpful. Um, but just a couple other things is to expect to pit down a deposit. Um, and with that deposit, that's generally when a guide will uh, reach out to you and let you know if the trip isn't able to go due to weather. That's up to the guide's discretion. Um, and most guides, depending on, you, know, you can ask them up front, but will be, if you got to cancel for weather, you've got about a year uh, or so to, to rebook that trip is generally how that deposit works. Um, so those are just a couple things uh, to keep in mind when you're booking with a guide. Um, also, remember that a lot of guides kind of survive off of tips. So that's another thing. And, and people sometimes ask, well, how much do you tip a fishing guide? Um, oftentimes, you can kind of compare it to a restaurant. If you go to a nice restaurant and you get served well and uh, you might see the waiter for five minutes total out of two hours or so, uh, most people tip for 20%. Think about that guy who's out there working all day, uh, polling or pushing around, teaching you various things you can use essentially for a lifetime, uh, different tips and tricks and whatnot, um, in terms of the amount of money that you, you want to tip on in that regard, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And the other thing I would add to that is, you know, um, I think, and some people kind of lose sight of this, you know, guides can work very, very hard for you and do everything possible to put you on fish and you may not catch fish or you may not catch, oh. as, right. Or you may not catch as many fish as you think. And sometimes that's on the angler, right. Cause you maybe weren't really honest about how you cast. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's called fishing and not catching. And so I would always encourage people, you know, when they ask me for that kind of advice is to really, ask yourself, did the guide do everything humanly possible to put you on fish? And if the answer is yes, then you need to take care of them. Uh, absolutely. And yeah, with that, I mean, we have days out here, 
you know, that I this summer, you go on a bluebird day, there's no wind, and then we're, we're looking for cruising reds on the flats, and they will just refuse a fly or a spoon or anything like that every single time. And it just happens. I, I a couple of days like that this summer where uh, the fish with friends or clients, and they look at me and they go, why won't they eat it? I go, I don't know. They're literally putting it on their nose, and they would just spook or push off or whatever. We try spin gear. We try everything. And unfortunately, it just sometimes happens that, even happens to the guides on the day off, on our day off, we're fishing at times as well. Um, but you make a great point there with, um, quote unquote, I almost say like it's the angler's fault and the bully's fault. Um, but oftentimes, um, it's really, really good to be as honest as possible up front with the guide with your experience. Um, you know, if you've been out fly fishing five or six times and it's only been in some mountain streams in western North Carolina, uh, don't call and say, Hey, I've been fly fishing for six years and, uh, you know, I'm really, really good. Um, let me know that you just been fishing for five or six times out in mountain, mountain trout fishing because it can definitely affect the type of trip that we go on in a saltwater environment and what I might need to do to help you out on the boat in terms of, uh, casting ability and, and, and getting that fly in front of the fish, uh, to, you know, to have the most successful day. So being as upfront and as honest as possible. And, we don't care how much you're experienced. Yeah, you don't have to have a lot of experience. In fact, I almost like taking beginners uh, more often than not. Um, but it, it, it definitely can be uh, useful to just have that information up front. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, too, particularly for saltwater fishing, you got to practice your casting. And then, you know, the other thing, and, you know, Chris, you and I have talked about this in the past, is, you know, if, you, if you've never been saltwater fishing, you know, generally the way it's going to work is you're going to, some if there are two of you, one of you is going to be in the bow fishing. And the guide's usually back on the polling platform calling out uh, a distance and a clock face off the bow. And, um, you know, one thing I like to do when I go out is to basically, you know, say to the guide, this is what I think 40 or 50 feet looks like at 11 o'clock, just to give the guide an opportunity to one, um, make sure that we have the same clock face. Cause I've seen it before where the guide's using a, you know, he's basically working the clock off the platform and not the bow of the boat. And also, you know, some people are better at guessing distance than other people. So if you tell him what you think 50 feet looks like, and it's short and he needs to tell you to go for 60 to get his 50, you know, that at the beginning of the day. It's that is that is super super helpful and a great point is identifying how you guys want to communicate throughout the day. So you know, saying hey, that is sixty feet. Let me go ahead and make that that cast, and also doing a couple of false casts or a cast uh, for the guide so we can uh, see your ability. Um, but yeah, a lot of these lines now, particularly the Rio line, I noticed they they come with a different color taper um, where the line goes from the running line to the uh, head. And so you can measure that out and say, okay, this is exactly like the Rio Redfish line I use is 37 feet of the blue before it changes to yellow. And I'll point that out to my client and say, today, we're rarely going to be having any yellow line into your cast. So that gives you an idea of the distance of it. Now think of adding seven or eight feet for a leader on top. So that can really, really help. Um, it is, it is crucial to be on the same page with the clock. Knowing the clock is super, super, super helpful. Um, being able to double haul is helpful, but it's not completely necessary. I take clients all the time that can't double haul, and I can help teach them to do it. Um, but also being aware of your line management is super, super helpful, um, just in terms of like stepping on a line, which is something you see a lot of folks do that they don't think about. Um paying attention to what that line is doing when it's around your feet or if you're stripping it into the stripping bucket um, is super helpful to you know, get that fly out there and have the most success with the guy because we can point that fish out to you all day long but if you've got it in a big knot you're wrapped around your ankle uh, something like that we can't do anything to make that fish stop and stop moving so being practicing that being aware of that is, is also very very important yeah, I think it's almost more important to uh, practice the line control over the casting, right? Because, um, I mean, I see a lot of people get messed up. And when I say practice your line control, if you're at home on the grass, you know, understand, like, how to manage, say, 60 feet of line uh, and how you're going to have to hold your fly because it's so different from trout fishing. You know, this isn't where you're seeing a riser and he's rising in the same spot and you just get to pick your moment. 
you know, you've got a fish moving across the bow of the boat. And if you take too long, you won't be able to cast to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting the, getting the fly out there with some speed and saltwater environment is super, super important. Um, these fish are moving and they may only give you a shot for a couple seconds, particularly in the Bar, where they're swimming around at 15 miles an hour underneath the water. Um, so you've got to be able to get that fly aerialized and get it out there quickly um, as well as accurately. And accuracy is more important in saltwater than, than distance, in my opinion, for a lot of the fishing that I do. Distance is important, but if you can place it well, you're more likely to catch fish than just to bomb it as far as you possibly can. Um, one trick that, that I've mentioned to nearly everybody that steps foot on my boat um, or folks that I'm teaching to cast is when I make that final forward cast, instead of just letting go with your line hand, which most people are casting with their right arm and they just let the line go when they sheet it out there, uh, you'll see the line oftentimes wraps around the rod or get around the reel handle or things like that. Take your fingers and turn them into a circle instead of completely releasing the line. And what that does, it makes your hand into essentially another guide. So that line is shooting out. You've got control of it. It's spinning through your finger, and then it's essentially going into a cone down to the first guide and then out the rest of the guide out. And if you do it properly, you will be able to have that line over your index finger that's on your rod hand ready to strip the fly in by the time that fly lands. So that's a, a trick that is exceptionally helpful with regards to line management. It's very, very easy to do. It will actually add a couple feet to your cast, and it will save you so many headaches of looking down and seeing the line wrapped around the butt of your fly rod uh, as the red takes your fly and, and bolts off and then breaks the tip. <laughs> yeah, and the other great thing, too, is you know your guide can coach you while the fly's in the air to drop it, and you can just pinch the line and drop the fly, right? You, you can do that, yes, yeah. So if you... Making that circle with your index finger and thumb is, is a trick that I wish somebody had taught me when I was learning how to fly cast. Uh, and I picked it up years ago, and every fly casting lesson I've done since then, in the past 10 or 12 years, I teach those folks to to utilize that because it's, it's just super, super helpful. Yeah, there you go. And, you know, uh, folks, uh, we love questions on the articulate fly. Chris is going to be back on the water soon. If you email them to us or shoot them to us on our Facebook or Instagram page, I'll send you some articulate fly swag and you'll get into a drawing for some flies from Chris at the end of the season. And, you know, to help you kind of reload the pipeline, uh, Chris, why don't you let folks know where they can find you so they can book you and get on your guide calendar? Sure. They can catch me at www.notthereelworld.com. That's not with a K. That's spelled K N O T. T H E R E E L W R R L D, not the real world.com. And it's the same Instagram theme uh, at not the real world. You can find me on there. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me. And more than happy to answer any questions or talk about guiding or, or be a client or what the fish is like. Yeah, there you go. And you know, folks, I always say fall is my favorite time to get out on the water. So you owe it to yourself to get out there and catch a few. Tight lines, everybody. Tight lines, Chris. Thanks, Marvin.